is one of the least known stories in American history. It is the story of black achievement and accomplishment. Against all odds, American blacks have built their own institutions, families, schools, churches, and businesses. Against all odds, American blacks have created great art and science, fought heroically in every American war. Against all odds, black men and women have worked endlessly to secure their own freedom and equality. The untold story of blacks in America is a 350-year saga of incredible achievements. This is that story. Hello, I'm James Avery. In this second episode of A History of Black Achievement in America, many black heroes emerge in this era of the nation's greatest expansion. It's the time of manifest destiny as America extends from coast to coast. Men such as James Beckworth and Jean du Sable pioneer the western frontier. Artists and intellectuals develop black culture in the north. Rebels challenge their enslavement in the south. It's a time when black achievement reaches new heights. From the earliest days of the nation, many blacks learn the complex skills needed to survive on the frontier. Now for some, these skills were a way to achieve freedom. Others used them to create the mythos of the frontier hero, self-sufficient, fearless American. Even after the Revolutionary War, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, blacks were still counted as three-fifths of a person, and most blacks remained slaves. The movement to end this absurdity, this nasty little institution in the South, took on the name the Abolitionist Movement. Out of this movement would come many black heroes. America's great cities, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Philadelphia. Philadelphia was founded by the Quakers' great spiritual leader, William Penn, in 1681. A Dutch trader, Peter Menui, bought Manhattan Island in 1624 from the Algonquin Indians for $24 worth of beads and cloth. The Spanish governor of California, Felipe de Nevien, in 1781, led 44 settlers to the fertile valley by the ocean that would later become Los Angeles. And Chicago was founded by Jean-Baptiste du Sable, a black man in 1772. Jean-Baptiste du Sable was born in Haiti in 1745. When du Sable's mother died, his father took him to Paris where he was brought up and educated. Then, for unknown reasons, Du Sable returns to the New World in the 1760s via New Orleans. He quickly learns frontiersman skills and takes up the trading and trapping lifestyle along the Mississippi River. Becoming an entrepreneur, he soon forms his own trading company. By 1769, Du Sable establishes a trading post at present-day Peoria, Illinois. He soon discovers a new area along the shores of Lake Michigan, a place the Indians called Eshikagu. Du Sable immediately recognizes the economic opportunity of placing a settlement at the mouth of the Chicago River. Soon he is traveling back and forth between Peoria and the new site. By 1779, he has built a permanent settlement that would evolve into Chicago. Du Sable was able to succeed because he possessed the unusual combination of skills possessed by all America's heroic frontiersmen, leadership, trapping, farming, shooting, and carpentry. He also spoke English, French, Spanish, and several Native American dialects. For many years, Du Sable's story was not known partly because he was black, 
and partly because he sold his Chicago holdings to John Kinsey in 1800. Consequently, the early histories of Chicago were written by Kinsey's friends and descendants. However, the situation was rectified in 1912, when Chicago officially recognized Jean-Baptiste du Sable as its founder. Ironically, 19th century historians paid a lot more attention to Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable as the founder of Chicago than to 20th century historians. But in 1928, two African-American women, Annie Neal and Alice Oliver, and their friends organized the Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable Memorial Society, and that really kick-started our recognition of du Sable as the city's founder. In 1935, du Sable High School opened at their insistence, and of course among their most important graduates were people like Nat King Cole. And of course in 1961, the first independent African-American museum in the country opened, du Sable Museum of African-American History. Fittingly, like another famous frontiersman, Daniel Boone, du Sable died on the next frontier in Missouri in 1818. Seventeen seventy six was the most important year for the new nation of the United States of America. In that year, Thomas Paine penned Common Sense. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. And a young black patriot, Lemuel Haynes, voiced what would later be recognized as the heart and soul of abolition. In seventeen seventy six, Haynes wrote the poem, The Battle of Lexington, in which he expressed the intellectual conflict between enslavement and America's fight for freedom. In the same year, he also wrote an unfinished treatise, Liberty Further Extended. In this work, he condemned enslavement as sin and made the plea that an African has an undeniable right to his liberty. Over the course of his life, Lemuel Haynes, more than any one of his time, embodied the two powerful counter-movements to enslavement. One was intellectual, the other spiritual. With the implementation of the first slave codes of 1705 and the branding of blacks as inferior came religious opposition to this economically driven institution. From the beginning, Quakers preached against slavery as evil. Then in 1740, a famous English preacher, George Whitfield, combined Calvinism with showmanship and brought his form of religious revivalism to the colonies in what would become known as the Great Awakening. Among the tenets that he preached was the immorality of owning slaves. Whitfield's fiery rhetoric sowed the seeds of abolition. It was at the end of the Great Awakening in 1743 that Lemuel Haynes was born in West Hartford, Connecticut. Abandoned by his parents, Haynes was given to a pious Massachusetts family as an indentured servant. He also grew up in an area that embraced the tenets of Whitfield's revivalism. Haynes more than likely learned of Whitfield's opposition to enslavement as a sin against God. At the age of 21, Haynes joined the Minutemen of Massachusetts after being released from the army because of typhus, he concentrated on expressing the deeper meaning behind the revolution. Haynes became part of a larger group of free blacks and slaves known for their literary output, expressing the idea of personal liberty for blacks. You have clergymen like Lemuel Haynes and other clergymen like Richard um, Allen, Absalom Jones, and several others who tap into this process that's a part of what I would call the revolutionary period, that is to separate it from the actual hot war. We know the Revolutionary War was 1776 to 1783, but like all wars, there's a period before that where people talk about why they're going to war and why they shouldn't go to war, and that's where this black intellectual process, this black uh, origins of black protest, talking about themselves as Americans and talking about themselves as slaves 
and suggesting to the patriots how they might also liberate Africans while they try to liberate themselves. After the war, Haynes picked up the mantle of Whitfield and in 1785 became the first black to become an ordained minister and the first to have his own congregation, a congregational church in West Rutland, Vermont. By this time, the abolition movement was well on its way to becoming a reality. After Haynes, the role of black leadership from the black church continued with Sojourner Truth, Martin Luther King Jr., Jesse Jackson, and many others in local black churches. The next two segments tell stories of two men who rose to the highest level of achievement, one in science and the other as an actor. This small monument outside of Washington, D.C., is a tribute to Benjamin Banneker. But in a way, this city of monuments, this grand national capital, is a tribute to this astonishing American. The U.S. Congress mandated that the nation create a new federal city. A site was chosen by George Washington on the Potomac River. Maryland and Virginia ceded land to the federal government, and the well-known New York architect Charles-Pierre L'Enfant was given the assignment of designing the nation's capital city. In early 1792, the temperamental and headstrong L'Enfant quarreled with the commissioners overseeing the project, and the two sides quickly reached an impasse. L'Enfant resigned, taking the plans for Washington, D.C. with him. Fortunately, Benjamin Banneker, who was part of the D.C. survey team, reproduced the plans from memory and we have the splendor that is the national capital today. Benjamin Banneker was the first of a long line of black American scientists and inventors. Fascinated by mechanical devices, at the age of 21, Banneker took a watch apart to study its design. Later, he built the first striking clock to be manufactured completely in America. He next studied astronomy and his predictions of solar and lunar eclipses were so accurate that they became a standard feature of his best-selling almanac. Many African Americans have traveled the same path as Banneker, George Washington Carver, Granville T. Woods, known as the Black Thomas Edison, and George Carruthers, who as a child was so inspired by Banneker that he went on to become one of the nation's leading aerospace engineers. Most potent, grave, and reverend seniors, my very noble and approved good masters. But I obtained when William Shakespeare wrote in 1603 his brilliant drama about racial jealousy and prejudice, little did he know that it would take until 1821 for a black, indeed an American free black, to be cast as Othello. He was James Hewlett, co-founder with William Henry Brown of the now famous African Grove Theater. By 1810, over 186,000 blacks were living in America's northern cities. Unable to participate in the dominant white culture's institutions of art, education, and entertainment, these free blacks were compelled to develop their own. There's something about the soul of all people that needs and demands such expression. One answer for the blacks living in New York City was the African Grove Theater. Inspired by James Hewlett's performances, entrepreneur William Brown constructed a theater on Mercer Street and hired a company of black performers to present plays to African-American audiences. The most popular plays of the African Grove were Richard III and Othello, but original works were also presented. King Shotaway, a play about a black Caribbean revolt on the island of St. Vincent's, 
was written by William Brown and was the first African-American play to be written and produced in the United States. The African Grove Theater's most popular actor was Ira Aldrich. Ira Aldrich was born in New York on the 24th of July, 1807, and educated at New York's African Free School, established in New York in 1787. He soon became active in New York's amateur theater scene, where he acted at the African Grove Theater. By the 1830s, he was performing in Europe and became the most famous black actor in the world. He did Shakespeare, appearing at the Royal Covent Garden in 1833 as Othello. Aldrich died while on tour in Poland on the 7th of August, 1867, and was buried with state honors on the 9th of August, 1867. The name of Ira Aldrich is inscribed with other Shakespearean celebrities at Shakespeare Memorial Theater, Stratford-upon-Avon. The African Grove Theater disappeared in 1824, but is today honored by a long tradition of black actors and entertainers performing on stages across the country every day of the year. And black actors such as Paul Robeson and James Earl Jones have gone on to give their own interpretations of Othello. While blacks in the North were developing social institutions and an artistic tradition, blacks from the West were opening up the frontier. Blacks in the South became heroes to their people by leading revolts against enslavement. Throughout the nearly 350 years of black oppression in America, black men and women have worked tirelessly for their freedom and equality. At times and places, these efforts have been peaceful and political, but at other times and places, militant and violent. In fact, during the period of enslavement, revolts were always just a heartbeat away. White masters were constantly on edge and fearful that one day their slaves would rise up against them. As early as 1712, white leaders in New York had to suppress a black insurrection that threatened the colony. 27 years later, along the Stono River in Charleston, South Carolina, a slave named Cato led more than 80 slaves in a revolt against white settlers. In the final battle, 25 whites and 50 blacks were killed. Then, at the start of the 19th century, Gabriel Prazer gathered nearly 1,000 slaves to join him in occupying the capital of Virginia. White leaders uncovered the plot and ruthlessly quashed it. Again in 1831, Nat Turner led his black followers in a violent struggle for freedom. In three days, they slaughtered 58 white men, women, and children before they were captured. His story was told in a remarkable piece of literature called The Confessions of Nat Turner. However, the revolt that might have turned the country upside down, turned America into a white North and a black South, is the revolt that never happened. Inspired by the slave uprising in Haiti, which overthrew their masters, Denmark Vesey, a free black in Charleston, had a similar plan for South Carolina a state where blacks outnumbered whites two to one. Whether a slave rebellion could have succeeded in controlling a colony or a state is debatable. But the legacy of black militancy to overcome oppression has been a part of United States history up to the present. Blacks challenging the establishment of white rule took place in violent clashes in Watts in 1964. In Detroit in 1967, and in Los Angeles in 1991. Well-organized plans for freedom and equality, such as Vesey's, have, however, had high moments. In 1955, the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott resulted in the desegregation of the city's buses. In 1963, 
Civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. initiated demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama, considered by many blacks as the most segregated city in the U.S. With the media filming every brutal aspect of the whites' reaction to the nonviolent demonstrations, Birmingham officials backed down and agreed to desegregate the city's facilities. Black Mountain Man James Beckworth was a hero's hero. Not many black men achieved legendary, even heroic, status prior to the Civil War. But James Beckworth did. So much so that even today, he is often portrayed in historical movies and plays by white actors. Beckworth, a freed slave born in 1798, spent the early years of his life on the Mississippi River watching the colorful French traders and trappers come and go through the swaggering city of St. Louis. At the age of 25, his reputation and ability as a hunter and trapper earned him a spot as a guide on General William H. Ashley's fur trapping expedition into the Rockies. Leaving the expedition after two years, Beckworth became a full-fledged mountain man, joining in the legendary exploration of such men as Kit Carson, Jim Bridger, and Jedediah Smith. Beckworth joined the Crow Indian tribe and became a chief. He roamed the West from the Cascades in the state of Washington to the deserts of Mexico. Along the way, he blazed the famous Oregon Trail through Crow Indian territory. And in 1850, he discovered a safer pass through the Sierra Nevada mountains into California that now bears his name. While Beckworth was the most famous black mountain man, he certainly was not the only one. Many blacks learned the skills needed in the mountains, met the Indians on their own terms, and savored that period of history that we know today as the era of the fur trade. It was a freedom available nowhere else in the nation at that time for blacks. As for Beckworth himself, he finally settled in Denver, opening a tavern along present-day Cherry Creek. There he dictated his autobiography, the autobiography of James Beckworth, carrying on the mountain men tradition of blending facts with outrageous exploits and accomplishments. He died in 1867. He spoke to you, yet he was dead. I didn't say he was dead. Well, wasn't he? Some said he was, yeah. The Underground Railroad produced many unsung heroes, everyday people both black and white, worked tirelessly to help slaves escape to freedom in the North. But no Underground Railroad conductor was more heroic in the cause of freedom for her people than the indomitable Black Moses, Harriet Tubman. This home in Auburn, New York, is a memorial to one of America's greatest social leaders of the 19th century. It is a memorial to the most famous conductor on the Underground Railway. It is a memorial to Harriet Tubman. The Underground Railroad arose in pre-Civil War America and was a secret passage organized by Northern abolitionists to help escaped slaves come from the South to northern free states in Canada. A typical route of the Underground Railroad would be from Maryland north to Delaware. From Wilmington, Delaware, fugitives traveled to Philadelphia, where sympathetic Quaker families hid the ex-slaves, fed and clothed them, and sent them north to New York. Here's a map of the many routes of the Underground Railroad. Today, many of the safe houses where blacks were cared for in these states are historic sites. In 1849, Harriet Tubman was a black slave living in Maryland. Afraid that she would be sold into the Deep South, she used the Underground Railway to escape to New York. A year later, she returned to Maryland and freed her sister and her two children. From then on, there was no stopping this courageous woman from becoming the most famous conductor of the Underground Railroad. In all, 
Tubman made 19 trips to slave states. She devised clever ruses to get into and out of the South. She carried a pistol, which she used to keep faint-hearted fugitives heading north, declaring, You'll be free, or you'll die. By 1856, there was a $40,000 reward on Tubman's head. Still, she persisted in being the Black Moses leading her people to freedom. During the Civil War, Harriet Tubman worked for the Union as a nurse and even a spy. When the war was over and blacks were free, Tubman returned to her home in Auburn, where she continued her involvement in social issues such as the women's rights movement. She died at her beloved home in Auburn on March 10th, 1913, at the age of 93. In the next episode of A History of Black Achievement in America, we shall see how blacks fought for their freedom before and during the Civil War. Thank you for watching. I'm James Avery.